Prologue, Part 3 Career Accomplished The door sprang open and revealed a smiling woman. Uilia was of medium height with brown hair and eyes. Her hair was straight and held back in a tail, though some of it hung at the sides of her round face. Welcome to Havlar, and of course, welcome back to our humble home, she said as Solmi pulled back his hood and she recognized him. Come on in. She stepped back from the doorway to allow Solmi to walk in. We're just getting our day started. What kind of a sleep schedule are you on? Where did you just come from? From Grendhill, Solmi replied, and for me it's evening now. I'll probably be ready to sleep around mid-morning. Would it be possible to use my old room? Ulia smiled again. Of course. We've cleared it out for you since you sent word that you would be coming for a visit. What brings you out here? How long will you be in town? Somi paused for a short moment. Well, I thought I'd bring my musical inclinations out here and see what the scene is like. I could be here for a few days or I could be here for several months, granted I don't wear out my welcome. Life was getting a little too monotonous. I wanted something different for a bit. I may hop from world to world for a week or two, but I think I'll probably end up staying here at least several weeks. Uilia nodded. There's some very interesting music these days. Some of the local musicians have started to play from the rooftops with a hat on the ground down below them. Others insist only on playing next to a warm fire at night. They say it's the best way to enjoy quiet, soothing music. She moved a stray strand of hair from her face. Oh, and how's your friend Domito and his family? She gave the last sentence slowly and in a clearly interested manner. Solmi slowly nodded as he spoke. Domita and Mifala are doing well. Grendhill is calm as always and loves the Farellas as always. Mifala has been looking large lately. Riedel agrees that she may be expecting more than twins. Solmi hated to withhold the complete information from a good friend like Uilia, but it was not time yet for everybody to know that the children had been born. One could never be sure who was watching or listening. Once people stopped speculating about where the arms might be, he could talk freely about the little princes and princesses, just not about the location of their special gifts. More than twins, eh? Uilia asked rhetorically. Well, that would make up for the late start they got. That's a good thing. The Farella house has always dealt justly, and it will do Grenhill good if they continue on forever. Well, I have chores to do, and you probably want to put down your load before everybody else attacks you with questions. If the kids are even interested enough to know what's going on outside of Hevlar. She led Solmi down the hall. Here's your door right where you were when you and Domito visited years ago. We'll have breakfast ready soon. Will you be hungry? Yes, thank you, but I may be late. I would like to get unpacked and situated in here first. Don't wait for me. Ulia smiled. All right, but don't take forever. Kasha will want to see you before he's snagged in the business of the day. As Solmi walked into the room, he closed the door behind him. Who knew how long he would be here? It was not an issue about whether he would wear out his welcome. The Farella family had long kept this house open for their needs whenever they needed it providing financial incentive for Uilia and her parents before her, and her grandparents before them, to keep it up and available. If Solmi needed it, being such close friends with Domito, he could use it as long as he needed. Though the Farella reign did not extend outside of Grenhill, let alone to this world, Grenhill and Hevlar were on friendly terms. The few people in Hevlar, aware of this house's use, had no objection to it. His exact timing and traveling depended on how safe the arms seemed. Solmi could not fully hide them right now. He needed to be sure that this room would be undisturbed while he hid them. He would wait instead until he bedded down to sleep. Of course, he couldn't stay on Harval long. He needed to travel more in case anybody was following him to obscure the possible location of the arms. He would travel for a couple of weeks, going to several different locations, always carrying the bag he had just set up on the floor. Always carrying the bag he had just set on the floor, keeping it filled to look as it did at this moment. He would travel with his hood up as if he still needed to conceal his identity. Perhaps he still would need to. As Solmi planned his route, he slid the bag under the bunk beds. He then remade the bottom bunk to his liking. He would insist for a few days if anybody saw it. 
so that the covers hung over the edge of the bed to the floor, hiding the space underneath. He pulled out of his shoulder bag a few changes of clothes, few for the sake of traveling light, and placed them on the foot of the bed, neatly folded. He then pulled a smaller box out of his shoulder bag, a case about two hands long, one hand deep, and one hand's width thick. He set this on the table next to the beds and smiled to himself. The wood his instruments were made of would enjoy the slightly higher humidity in Hevlar. Before heading to the main room of the house for breakfast, Solmi indulged an urge to take a reminding look at this room's usefulness. He walked over to the stone wall at the back of the room. The room was partially below ground level, so as he stooped, he looked for a particular stone low to the floor. He found it with his eyes, a stone with a groove and a bump on the top of the surface that jutted out from the wall. He lay his left index finger in the groove and tapped the bump five times, each time with a different finger of his right hand. The stone faded and disappeared, followed in turn by the stones around it, silently opening a circular hole in the wall a few feet wide. The hole gave way to a dirt tunnel leading down into the ground. This was the place to hide the royal arms. Are you stuck at home, bored, hiding from the coronavirus? Do all those reruns of kitchen nightmares and hoarders have you feeling sick to your stomach? Well, you can find something that will put your mind at ease by catching Julianne, aka Werecat, streaming most weekdays at either 8 a.m. to noon central or from 8 p.m. central to late on twitch.tv slash Werecat. Come show some love as she fights her way up the ranks of the worldwide gaming phenomenon League of Legends with her unique happy-go-lucky attitude. You can even jump in on the chat and give her your hot takes as the action unfolds. Not in a chatty mood? Feel free to kick back and relax as her bubbly commentary provides a fun backdrop against some of the coolest video game action on the web. Want to be kept up to date on all things Werecat related? That's easy. Just follow the link on her page and crawl on in to her Discord server called The Cat Cave. Share memes, jokes, stories, and voice chat with some of the coolest cats around. In addition to League of Legends, she may also be playing Jackbox games, stream marble racing, battle block theater, and many more. Do you have a request for a game she should play? Be sure to leave your recommendations in the chat, and you may see one of your favorite games being featured in the future. Come on by to twitch.tv slash werecat. That's twitch.tv slash w-h-e-r-e-c-a-t. We look forward to seeing you there. King Ogfi, Princess Mindayo. Esquis, one half to Sala turn later. T four six zero four two five six zero. Zulfa rocked her baby tenderly and smiled despite her exhaustion. What a beautiful little girl she now held in her arms. The travail of childbirth was now forgotten in her joy. Soon she would sleep. Just a few more moments looking at her little Mindayo. Then she would give in to sleep. A sage woman had been present for the birth, of course. Getting a sageman's impressions for a newborn was an ancient tradition and wasn't to be neglected, especially for people of Zulfa's position. The sage woman had said Mindael would be resolute and honest with herself. As Zulfa thought about this, she wondered if there was any way to misunderstand it. Sageman impressions were almost always positive but could at the same time leave room for gross character faults. A man with a kind disposition could be nearly unable to say no to a drink and end up constantly inebriated. A caring person could easily be hurt and end up a hermit living alone to avoid the pain. Resolute and honest with herself. That must be a good thing, but circumstances could always turn one's good attributes against his or her own welfare. In Mindyle's case... Her welfare involved the welfare of thousands of other people. Zulfa hoped life would be favorable to her child. Zulfa heard some noise outside in the corridor. People talking. Then the door opened, and King Ogfi walked in, drenched in sweat. 
Zulfa's smile turned into an accusatory scowl. Where were you? she asked her husband, even though she already knew the answer. I was on the training grounds, he answered. I need to oversee our army's training. It has to happen. You should have been here, Zulfa almost shouted. Her exhaustion was impairing her thinking. She shouldn't raise her voice while Minda slept in her arms. She lowered her voice. They'll carry on just fine without you for a day or two. Ogfi shook his head. I need to train too. If I spend a day away from the training grounds, I'll know the difference. I won't be as fast or sure of myself. If I spend more time away from training, your enemies will notice it. Zulfa finished the adage for him. She'd heard this many times before. Ogfi, how relevant is training when Aeschylus has never been involved in a single real battle before, let alone a full war? Sure, I know we need to be ready to defend ourselves, but surely one day... She was too tired to keep this up. Ogfi smiled. Look, love, I know we disagree on how important this is, but one day... He stopped. What name have you given her? Mindyle. One day, Mindyle will rule in my place. She'll know the importance of training. I'll make sure of it. She'll have to be ready to protect her lands, as I am ready now. He paused. He inhaled deeply, then exhaled slowly. I can feel the destiny of Aeschylus nearing. Can't you? One day, Mindyle will live that destiny. I need to have our armies ready to fulfill it, and she will need to keep them ready to defend it. One day, Mindyle will be queen of Grendhill. Zulfa was asleep. Hi, Don Bishop here. I hope you enjoyed today's story segment. If you've been following the podcast so far, then you must have noticed that today we started a new format, splitting narration and discussion into separate episodes. This will help me produce the podcast much more easily and quickly. So far, episodes have come two weeks apart, and I would like to speed that up. Going forward, you will see in each episode title whether it has story or discussion content. The Grand Hill Chronicles podcast is brought to you by my Patreon subscribers, and today I would like to thank Carolyn Bishop and Poster Number X for their patronage. If you have enjoyed this reading, you can also become a patron and support this project by going to patreon.com slash grandhillcron. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts, rate us on Apple Podcasts to make it easier for other listeners to find us, or... On YouTube, subscribe and ring the bell to get notifications of future updates. Of course, you can always tweet at me or follow my Instagram or the Facebook page. Just search Grand Hill Cron wherever you are on social media. All these things will help this project gain visibility so others can find us. And of course, as always, if you want to read ahead, just jump on the website at thorn.link slash grandhill. That's T-H-O-R-N dot L-I-N-K slash Grendhill, and you can read the web novel at your own pace. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs>